Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 10. I'm Steve Kwan. I'm Matt Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent BJJ approach. Today, continuing our conversation about the mental aspect of jiu-jitsu, we're going to be talking about overcoming plateaus. Yep. Uh, as we all know, jiu-jitsu is a ongoing journey. So hopefully today we can sort of discuss a few strategies that you can utilize to prevent yourself from plateauing in jiu-jitsu. This is something that I think is going to prove to be helpful for a lot of people. There are several sides to the mental area of jiu-jitsu that you need to focus on. We've already talked about how you accelerate your learning, but a big portion of the long-term game is how do you keep getting better consistently when you're looking at things over the period of years or even decades? Yeah, one of the more common things that I get asked from practitioners over the years is they, one of the main things they, they come across is the problem of just getting stuck in a rut and feeling like their game is uh, staying stagnant and that they're having issues moving forward. Uh, and then that creates frustration and it can become a little bit of a cycle. Uh, so hopefully we can kind of break the cycle and find different ways to keep learning and progressing. So the way I hear people describe this a lot is I've hit a plateau, you know, and, and the way I interpret that is someone is saying, I'm not seeing the gains that I used to see. You know, maybe you're used to coming in and measurably getting better on a week to week, month to month basis, even day to day basis, but you can go for a long period of time without actually seeing any significant gains. Now, that doesn't mean you're not actually experiencing significant gains. It just means you're not noticing them. And that actually might be an interesting thing to talk about at some point down the episode, right? Just because you feel like you've hit a plateau doesn't mean you actually we have yeah and and if you've been training jiu-jitsu for any amount of time you know that it's a you know some people for some people it's a love and hate sort of thing and you know just uh, it could be that people in the gym that you used to you just absolutely used to dominate are now improving at such a great rate now that you know you're not dominating them anymore and then psychologically that plays with your mind and you feel like oh my god i used to smash that guy and now he's taking it to me or you know he's able to i can't pass his guard anymore um, these honestly, these are good things and it, you need to look at it as a good thing. Uh, not necessarily that you are not improving, but that the level in the room is, is rising and that other people are, uh, improving their own game and putting in the effort. So honestly, they deserve to get better. And overall, you're going to get better training from this scenario. That's a really good point. I, I think if you were to really analyze people, you would find that when they say they've hit a plateau, they're probably making that evaluation because they are measuring themselves to the people they normally train with, right? Maybe they were previously on the same level as some of their partners, and then those those partners went through dramatic gains. And that's unfortunate because we've already talked about the mental model of self-competition and how the only person you should really compete against is yourself. But admittedly, it is harder to do that <laughs> than it sounds, right? It's yeah. very, very hard to pull your ego out of the equation. And I think a lot of the time when people say, hey, I've hit a plateau, they're, what they're actually saying is I am measuring myself against the guys in the room and they've gotten better. And I've noticed that they're now giving me a harder time than they used to. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you've hit a plateau. That just means your training partners have improved. And to your point, Matt, that's only a good thing. You know, the, the better the training partners you have, the better you are going to get over the long term, even if it means you're going to be tapped out a few times in the short term. Oh, absolutely. Like only if you have an ego, is this a negative thing? Um, and I can, I can understand why some people would find it negative. Uh, and, and that's because they just, their ego is in the way of their, of their growth. If you, if someone, uh, it, you used to do way better than them and then now they're starting to take it to you or, you know, they're able to give you a really good defense and you're having very difficult roles with them. Um, first of all, you, it's very important in life, I think, to be a healthy person, to be able to be happy for someone's growth. Uh, that's something that we didn't really talk about, but it's such an important skill to have that ability to be happy for someone. And especially when you're when you're fighting each other on a daily basis, um, it, it just it makes it such such more of an enjoyable experience to be happy for your partner, to see them grow. And um <clears throat> And definitely, you know, when your partner is starting to now give you these difficult roles, it's going to expose weaknesses in your game, 
right? Like there's lots of factors why someone might be improving and, and, and offering you uh, a, a lot of difficulty when before they didn't. And part of the reason of that is because when you're training with someone so often, you learn each other's moves, right? So, so you might find that you're, you know, do, not doing so good against someone that you used to really do well against. Uh, but then you go to a different gym and you just cream everyone because nobody knows your game at a different gym. Whereas your training partners are very accustomed to your tricks and, you know, you all usually learn the same systems and, and have similar strategies. So definitely just remember that no matter what happens, whether you're having good weeks or bad weeks, it doesn't mean that you're getting worse. If you feel like you're plateauing, we're going to like we're going to continue talking about things that you can do to to prevent this from happening, but just re- like remember that it doesn't necess- you, you know, the the self-competition aspect is really important and that we're not really uh we're not gauging ourselves against people in the room. At least if we are, that's not the healthiest way to uh, to approach our our growth. Yeah, it, it, it's funny that, that you bring this up because when I, I, you know, the guys that I train with, I, there are white belts that I train with who give me a pretty big struggle sometimes. And it's because I've trained with them so much that they know my game. So, you know, even though I'm technically more experienced than them, they know what I'm going to do. So they can at least put up a rudimentary defense and they give me more of a challenge than someone I've never sparred with before might or, or vice versa, right? Um, you know, when you when you spar with someone for the first time, I find a lot of the time, you know, initially there's a lot of submissions and, and a lot of positional dominance back and forth. The first few times you spar with someone, because you don't know what the person's going to do. But once you do know what that person's going to do, <laughs> if you've sparred with them a lot, you do start to kind of see that the the matches become a little bit less exciting because when you know what the other guy is going to do and vice versa, it kind of becomes a game of shutting down the other guy or, uh, of shutting down the other guy's game. And incidentally, this is one of the reasons why it is so important to train with a wide variety of people and to go outside of your comfort zone. If you just train with a, the same people over and over again, you will hit a plateau because there aren't any new variables being introduced into your environment. Yeah. And especially if you're training with people that you can always beat. And if you're specifically seeking people that you can always beat, like you always want to train with smaller, uh, older or lower ranks, um, you know, there's a time and place we already just, dis- we're going to discuss plus, plus, minus and equals, but, um, you always want a wide variety of training partners, much like Steve is talking about. You want guys that are better than you guys that are the same level and guys that are, are, uh, more beginner. So you can have a wide variety of, of UKs that you can practice your techniques on. And at the same time, you know, in real time, fo- focus on using your, uh, the realistic reactions to high level opponents. Yeah. And when you're talking about the guys who who are less experienced than you, the objective there is not to just smash them, right? What you should hope for is that they get better, right? That's what you want out of your training partners. You want to take those junior guys that you're sparring with and get them experienced enough, especially experienced enough with your game so that they become a bigger challenge for you, right? That should be the goal, right? If you want to get better, if if you want to overcome plateaus, you don't want to be fighting the same guy over and over and winning the same way every time. You should hope that you go in there and you play your game and eventually he learns your tricks and then you have to go outside of your comfort zone and learn more. That is only a good thing. So the objective to the minus in that plus minus equals discussion is not to bolster your ego or make you feel good. It's because you want to be able to try new things against an opponent where you might have a chance of success and you want to raise the caliber of the people in the room at the same time. Yeah, and, and like in my situation, being a, a, an instructor of a school, you know, when you start a school, there there tends to be uh, new people that come in and and they don't know jujitsu right off the bat. I've been pretty fortunate that I have experienced guys coming to see me, so I'm I'm extremely lucky in that way. But a lot of instructors that open a school have, um, you know training partners that might not be at such a high level or if you want to be a competitor as well as the head instructor it's going to be difficult for you to find ways to continue to push yourself and one of the best ways is to uh, as quickly as you can cultivate quality in the room and make the make sure that even the junior students are are progressing at a higher rate that's going to incur- it's going to set the tone in the room and it's also going to give you better training in the future it's yeah. a, you're essentially creating an investment right you're not so much investing uh, directly 
completely in yourself, but you really are by directly mm-hmm. investing in other people. And like I like just to hit at home, what we were talking about earlier is is guys try to try to develop the ability to be happy for your training partners this is this is a skill that is so important even in family life in the workplace uh, it's generally going to make you a more pleasant person to be around and a more genuine person yeah i've heard this term uh, and it's a term i like uh, described as the the uh, the abundance mindset basically the idea being that hey someone else's success does not mean a loss for you. It doesn't mean they're taking something away from you. It's possible to have a win-win scenario, right? Just because someone is getting better, that doesn't deny you the opportunity to get better, right? So you should celebrate the successes of your teammates, even if that means they beat you. That, you know, you need to be able to be happy for other people. And you need to understand that, hey, even if in the short term, their improvements might mean that on the mat, they're able to give you a challenge. Over the long term, that is also going to force you to step up your game, right? Absolutely. So a big part of overcoming plateaus is not just what you do with yourself, but it's also of being mindful of your training partners and being supportive of them, especially making sure that they're able to challenge you. You know, to your point earlier, Matt, about raising the quality of the people in the room, If you try to kind of keep secrets from the people you're training with and hope that you can spring tricks on them, that's really not going to help you grow much over the long term. I find it's much more effective to give all of my tips and techniques to the people I train with. I will openly tell them how I'm beating them or what I'm doing so that they learn how to shut it down because then now I have to play a better game, right? It's, It's in my best interests to make sure that they know everything I know. Yeah, it's it's like the Marcelo Garcia effect, you know, he, when he shows people him rolling in the maybe not not so much nowadays when jujitsu is um, online jujitsu is so available and there's so many techniques out there. But a few years ago when he started as Marcelo Garcia uh, in action, his online academy, he would just show all of his stuff basically and and just say, well, I don't care. I'm going to show everything and and uh, I'm still going to beat you in competition because I'm that good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I like to do that because like we like you said, Steve. People can now learn your tricks and it forces you to further evolve the sequences and deal with more sophisticated defenses. But, you know, it just feels so good to 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 help people out. And uh, if you can go into a practice room and have that mentality rather than, you know, I'm not going to let anyone get a point on me. I don't want I don't want anyone passing my guard or whatever. I'm just going to play the most boring, frugal game. Uh, Sometimes that can start working against you. Yeah, we talked about this in an earlier episode, the principle of investing in loss, basically meaning that you have to be willing to be bad at something if you want to be good at it. And your ego is threatened by this, right? Like if I, if I, for example, know that there's a guy in my gym who can beat me every time, my ego is going to want me to avoid that guy because my ego is comfortable when I'm winning or doing well. Um, but if I want to be able to really challenge myself and grow, I need to view losing losing as an investment, right? Losing, when you lose because you, in training, right? When you, when you're sparring with someone in training and you lose, that is an investment because you are taking that loss as an opportunity to, to learn and to go outside of your comfort zone. The alternative is to avoid loss. But the problem with doing that is you also avoid areas of growth. Similarly, if you're trying new techniques, right? The, if you are going to do anything for the first time or anything that you're good at, or sorry, that you're not, um, you're not good at, it's going to be a struggle, right? You're probably going to fail. Uh, if, for example, there's a particular guard I want to play and I've never done it before. Yeah, the first few times I do it, I'm going to be terrible at it. And for some people, that can be a real ego threat, right? And they might avoid things outside of their regular game because they don't want to look bad. This Mm -hmm. especially for me uh, becomes a problem as you get higher and higher in rank, right? When you're a white belt, you, you don't mind looking that bad. But man, once you get up to like purple or brown, you start to be mindful of how other people in the room might be perceiving you. And you start to think, oh man, I can't be see, I can't be getting tapped out by people because I'm a senior guy now. Mm-hmm. So your ego kind of forces you to move towards a game that you're comfortable with because you know it. And if you force, if you always just go back to the same well over and over again, and you don't learn any new moves, you're never going to grow, right? So uh, what you want to do is you actually want to be trying things that you're bad at 
understand that losing in training is an investment in your own growth and go into those situations, lose, take, you know, yeah, you're going to lose, but over the long term, that's going to help you learn things that you wouldn't have learned otherwise. Right. Like, for example, I might want my partner to get me in a full arm bar, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then I can work my way out and, you know, yeah, I might get tapped. And even if he's a lower rank, whatever it's it's if you can fully not have an issue with tapping to a lower rank um then you're going to allow that scenario to happen and you can get more familiar with the the intricacies of the defenses and work your way out and then you gain experience working your way out of the submissions or in terms of leg locks you know we discussed before like let, i'm gonna let my opponent get into different leg entanglements with me and then i'm gonna work my way back out of that whereas if i just avoid leg entanglements altogether um, my, my XP in that scenario is a lot lower than it might be. So, so I, again, I'm investing, I might get heel hooked a few times. In fact, if I'm going to learn heel hooks, I'm definitely getting heel hooked. And that's, that's what I had to do with my professor Rob is I, when, when we would practice leg locks for hours on each other, I'd just be like, Hey, I'm going into these positions. I'm going to get heel hooked and I'm ready to tap. And then, you know, eventually you reach a level where you don't get tapped anymore and you can kind of re-entangle and you're more familiar with it uh, another another great example of investing in loss like i i train uh, usually once a week with bibiano fernandez who's an mma legend a bjj legend um you know i i think he's a third or fourth degree black belt i'm not even sure um multiple time mma champion and world champion in jiu-jitsu he's this guy's unreal and he's smaller than me uh but just a really amazing athlete and um you know, sometimes we'll, we'll do one-on-ones in the gi and I know that, uh, I'm probably going to get, I'm going to get beat up. Like he's, he's really got amazing pressure that I'm not so much used to because he's so old school. His game is so, uh, you know, jujitsu has evolved so much and he still uses what works for him. And that's usually low base and pressure. And uh, I have real issues with it. And I, I seek out these training sessions because I find I gain so much from him. Even when I go with him, you know, I know that uh, I'm probably going to get my guard passed. But at the end of the session, I realize how much experience I've gained from rolling with someone who's so good. So you invest that in yourself, willing to put yourself in a vulnerable situation in order to get that experience and to benefit yourself that much more in the future. Yeah. From my own personal experience, something I've been working on over the last few months, much to the chagrin of my training partners, has been my turtle and my back defense. You know, my, my mindset is, well, hey, if I can defend myself from these pretty terrible positions. I can, you know, I should be pretty solid. So I've been intentionally giving up turtle and giving up back. And um, over the last few months, my defense from both of these positions has gotten way better, right? So you've got to, this kind of ties into a lot of the things we've previously talked about, like being comfortable, being uncomfortable. A lot of getting better is understanding where your weaknesses are and not being afraid to go outside of your comfort zone. That's a lot of the time how you get better. And when it comes to overcoming plateaus, it's important when you, if you feel like you're hitting a plateau, you know, as we mentioned earlier, first of all, you have to understand if it's really a plateau or if it's just that your trading partners are getting better. But second, it also requires you to analyze your own game and your own situation and look for the areas where you need to push yourself outside of that comfort zone and invest in a loss. Now, Matt, something that you talked about earlier was, uh, you know, when it comes to like investing in a loss, a big question is, well, how do I choose what loss to invest in? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the importance of being critical of your training environment. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, um, and, and this is where sometimes we get caught up in stuff like loyalty is we'll go to a school and, you know, we have great experience at, at, at a particular academy and, you know, we just, we train there for 10 years and we we're, we're loyal, you know, you, you build great relationships, great friends, you, your instructor has been good to you. Um, but there comes a time where if you want to, to achieve a high level of jujitsu, you almost have to be critical of your training environment and, and even your instructor. And that's where people feel like they're maybe betraying their instructor a little bit, uh, because you want to learn other things, but just realize that, um, you know, your instructor doesn't know everything. Like I, I'm, I'm a gym owner. I don't know everything. I, I encourage my students to go to other schools and learn. So you need to be able to look around the room and and say to yourself, you know, is there false positives here? Like are are the high ranks in this gym actually 
like brown belts and purple belts or are they you know is there is there something going on here where it's kind of uh people are comfortable here it's almost like a, it, you're you're getting too comfortable training with these people because you're not getting challenged if if you can be critical of your training partners and your environment and that doesn't mean being a dick right that doesn't mean lo- saying you guys suck like we need to be better than this right even though I know I do know some scenarios where that's happened and it's been beneficial for the for the person, but but to be able to to see you know is my instructor teaching me things that um, that I that I want to learn? It, maybe my my instructor has bad knees, so they don't like to do you know certain leg attacks. They don't like to do certain takedowns because their knees are bad. Well, uh, I might have to go somewhere else. I might have to source some, 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 I might have to find some different resources to find that information. I might have to go to a different school or sign up for an online academy or get a DVD or, you know, spend some time on YouTube looking up instructional. I can't always rely on my instructors and my training partners to give me information that I want. So, you know, knowing, knowing that you want certain things and you want to, you want to reach a high level, try to identify which things are missing from your game and what your training partners and your instructor can offer you. And then try and think of a game plan for how you're going to acquire and hone that information and make it a part of your game. Yeah. I think an important thing to add there too, is that you know, when you hear about people leaving gyms, usually the you, you think of like, oh, there must have been some big falling out or maybe they don't get along. But that it doesn't have to be how it is, right? Sometimes you can have a, a great instructor and sometimes you, you know, maybe you have a great relationship with them and maybe in the past they were the right instructor for you. And at that point in time, you got a lot of value out of that instructor. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that they are the right person to teach you right now or in the future future. Sometimes you just outgrow that relationship. You know, the the Mm -hmm. best example I can maybe give is like, hey, maybe you really, really liked your grade two math teacher, but that doesn't mean you want to be learning math from your grade two math teacher for the next 10 years, Mm -hmm. right? You know, sometimes in your learning journey, you just outgrow that person or their style, or maybe you would just benefit from being exposed to a different style. So it shouldn't be, uh, you know, leaving your instructor or leaving your, your area of training, that doesn't necessarily necessarily always have to be a bad thing. And and in fact, it should be celebrated in a lot of situations. For sure. And if your instructor has problems with you wanting to move on and they don't understand that, that's really on them, right? That's a weakness Mm -hmm. from their, for for them. That's something that they have to work on. Yeah. I've, I've, I've had students that, um, that have had to leave because they, you know, life, they, they have to go to school somewhere else. They have to go to, they have to have a job somewhere else. Um, if your instructor really cares about you, they'll, they will let you go. You know what I mean? That old saying, if you love someone, <laughs> let them go. It's, it's true, right? If, if your instructor becomes spiteful, um, it, and has hard feelings, then you're, you know, you're, you're just exposing their weakness. You're, you're seeing them for who they really are, right? A true instructor is going to say, Hey, you know what? It has been a slice and, um, I don't want any bad blood between us. Uh, I've loved training with you and, you know, I wish you all the best in the future. And again, there, that is where you're, you know, you're being happy for someone for, for the growth in their life, right? Life happens. So you're, you do, and, and you got to realize guys that when you go to a school and you're loyal to a school and maybe one day you have to leave for whatever reason, um, loyalty is not, <laughs> it's not set in stone. You know what I mean? Just because like you, 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 you should be loyal to someone because they've been good to you, not because uh, of a certain gym name or, or, or honor or whatever that you, let's just remember that students are paying customers and this is a free country and you can train wherever you want. And uh, a good instructor will embrace that and they'll wish you well. So Matt, another thing that you had suggested we cover is training with purpose. So the idea here, at least from my understanding, is you don't just want to train. You don't just want to go to class and, you know, then leave and then come back to class again later. You want to have a goal for every training session. Um, the way that I've always interpreted this is you want to kind of think in terms of short-term goals and in terms of long-term goals. Right. Now, on one hand, of course, you want to have a long-term goal and objective to your jujitsu journey. But on the other hand, even for shorter-term things, like for your training session today, you might want to set individual goals for, hey, here's what I want to accomplish today. That's right. Like when, let's say I, when I meet up with Bibiano and train, uh, first and foremost, I, 
I don't want to get my guard passed. And he's a very good guard passer, very strong pressure, like we were talking about. So um, if I'm going to go to a training session with him, I know it's going to be difficult. And I know that uh, a good place to start, a realistic goal is for me to to try to prevent the guard pass. And then, you know, if I'm successful with that, I can try to sweep. Um, I'm not going into a training session with someone like that and saying, I'm going to try and smoke him because first of all, it's unrealistic. And uh, second of all, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's just not the most modest thing to think about it. If you set goals that are super unrealistic like that, then um, sometimes it's easy to to get down on yourself a little bit. So mm-hmm. having realistic goals and just targeting your training a little bit more specifically is going to help you uh, make strides little by little, but over time it makes it, it makes for better growth. I like what you're saying about being humble in, in your goals. Uh, and I think this comes back to what we talked about earlier regarding competing with yourself versus competing with other people. I, I think personally, and I mean, I, I don't compete, so you know, you correct me if I'm wrong, but my feeling has always been that you're better off setting goals that use yourself as a benchmark versus goals that use someone else as a benchmark, right? It, like a good example for me of a goal would be, you know, today I want to work on my guard passing or today or, or one specific guard pass or, you know, today I want to improve my defense from side control. If, mm-hmm. if you go in and be like, today my goal is to tap out Jimmy, <laughs> like like that, that, that is uh, not really a goal that is in spirit of, you know, being competitive with yourself and not really with someone else, right? You, you can't always control what another person is going to do. And from my perspective, for the, when it comes to having a solid mindset, you're better off not hooking an anchor to somebody else. Yeah. And, and also if you go into training and you're just basically just free rolling and, and, uh, flowing and, you know, I, I like to be, uh, I like to counter a lot, so I'll, I'll try to let my opponent do what they want to do, and then I'm going to try to capitalize on their um, game plan. And sometimes that's not the best for competition because you're waiting for rea- uh, you're waiting for something to happen. And uh, a lot of the time, when you compete, you can't be passive like that. You have to go in with a frame of mind that you want to accomplish something. So, for instance, if I pull guard and then I, you know, and I just sort of sit there and try and just focus on holding my guard. Um, Sometimes it can give your opponent opportunities to to begin their passing and then you quickly find yourself behind. Whereas if you pull guard and then you pull guard right into a Kazushi or, or try and get your opponent off balance right away and uh, and get them moving and, and trying to maintain their base, you're going to have a much better foundation to set up sweeps and, and possibly attacks from the bottom. So just, just going in there and having an idea of what you know you want to do is very beneficial for the competitor. Yeah. And, you know, as they say, you know, you want to have a plan, but plans never survive first contact with the enemy, right? So you never want your plan to be so rigid that it can't possibly change, right? You know, you don't want a situation where, hey, I've got this game plan, but if my opponent remotely deviates from my expectations, then my plan is out the window. There's a kind of a science to planning where you want it to be, you know, specific enough that it's it's useful, but general enough that it is subject to change. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, my, my goals going into training sessions are going to be very different from someone who's brand new. For instance, my goals are going to be things like, you know, I don't want to get my guard passed. Uh, I, I'm thinking more of like in terms of points. Uh, obviously, I don't want to get submitted, but um, I'm willing to get submitted if it means that I'm going to be learning something out of it. So I'm not I'm not like a dead, dead set against getting submitted. I'd prefer to be more positionally sound. If I do get into a situation where I'm getting caught in a submission, I want to know why that situation happened and how I can avoid that and prevent that. And also I, you know, if I am in an arm bar, I do want to practice some of my defenses. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we, we do a bridging escape at my club. That's really good that I learned from Kyle Tara. And, uh, you know, if, if I get caught in an arm bar, I'm going to try and put that escape to use. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and goals of someone who's brand new are going to be totally different survive yeah exactly i if i'm brand new to jujitsu and maybe i'm not in the best condition or i'm coming in uh, as an older practitioner one of my goals might be to not sit out around right you might have issues with cardio that you're trying to overcome so sometimes fighting every round can be really difficult in training then when you can accomplish that and you can go every round without sitting out you want to think about how can i 
not get my guard passed is usually the main thing that I try and focus on, you know, winning the engagement phase of guard, uh, establishing a guard and trying to, if you, if you can prevent the guard pass, why not go for a, a sweep or even an attack from the bottom? So setting these little goals, uh, especially realistic goals are going to help you for sure. This is a good point because up until this point, when we've talked about training with purpose, you know, why, how you want to make sure that you go into every, everything related to jujitsu with an idea of what your goal is. We've talked mostly about, hey, I want to work on a technique or a position, but you can also work on things like your mindset, right? If, for example, or, or things like your cardio, if you're, to your example, if you think that cardio is a problem that you're dealing with, then maybe your goal is to just not sit out any rounds. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if, you know, you think that you hit a plateau, maybe you can identify some reasons why you might be feeling that way, such as, you know, maybe you need to train with stiffer competition. Maybe you realize that you're dodging some of the better guys in the gym, maybe your strategy then should be, hey, my goal today is I'm going to train with the most advanced guy in the class, the guy who's most likely to beat me. You know, and in that case, you're not really setting a technique goal, but you're setting more of a mindset, mindset goal. goal. And something like that can be way more useful in the long term. Um, this is something that I have personally done and I found very helpful is, you know, bef before I go into class, if there's something particularly that I want to work with, like if I noticed, hey, you know, I've, I've been sparring mostly with guys my own size or my own level, uh, or sorry, or, or level below me, I'll look for more senior people or I'll look for people who are a lot bigger than me and mm -hmm. seek them out as partners. Yeah, and, or or let's say, you know, you just like you, you use the example earlier of of you discovering a new guard that you haven't used before or maybe you're trying to use a uh, an entry into a certain position a leg entanglement you want to try and get as many reps in real time as you can you're going to try and rep out that entry or you're going to try and you know if you if you get leg locked a lot you want to try and go into the leg entanglement and uh and and pummel your legs and and fight for levers and sit in the pocket essentially and really get as much experience as you can in those positions when you know maybe if you're not really good at leg locks you might try and avoid the whole leg entanglement situation altogether so essentially you know creating uh creating goals that are specific to things that you can improve on identifying these weaknesses in your game and and most of the time it is putting yourself in more uncomfortable positions but like like we've talked about so much that's where the true improvement happens yeah and it can sometimes be helpful to seek out a training partner who can help you with those goals you know if you want to work on a position that is maybe a little bit it's just something you don't often find yourself in you know i don't know maybe you want to work on defending the 411 but no one's putting you in the 411 so you don't get that opportunity sometimes the best thing to do is just find a training partner who will work on that particular area of the game with you and just let them get you in that position and then you go from there and you reset when you get out yeah like much like targeted sparring i mean they get they get to put you in that position um when maybe they you're more advanced and you wouldn't allow them to normally get to your back or whatever right mm -hmm. so so you get the reps defending the position and then they get the reps attacking the position it's it's a symbiotic relationship that's really win-win that's you a do great it properly. point great point because for a, for a long time my back defense was not very good simply because guys just you know if i was sparring with guys my own level I, they normally wouldn't even get to that position but the problem i started encountering is when i was sparring with guys way above my level they would take my back and i wasn't nearly as developed there as i should be so mm -hmm. part of what i do now is i try to make sure that i specifically get an opportunity to work on those positions so that i i can patch up those holes that might not come up in regular roles right mm -hmm. Some, sometimes the things you really need to work on don't come up in regular sparring and that's why you need to go out of your way to find those opportunities the reality is everyone builds a game that works for them and you learn to strategically avoid the positions that don't work for you and if you get good at at your game then you might never get into these positions that actually you need to work on so that's why finding someone that that you can tell and say hey i want to work on this position with you and just going from there that can be super helpful yeah, another another great example that's very common um, I find amongst pr practitioners is sometimes you'll get someone who's specifically a gi guy who has no idea how to fight for leg entanglements, has no idea how to when the reap is even coming, and once they get in, caught in a reap, they basically just give up because they think their leg's going to explode, um, and they tap either out of fear or they just can't move and they get freaked out. Or you'll have a no gi person who, you know, has no idea how to grip fight in the gi, and you huge gaping holes in, in either practitioners uh, uh, games and and when they come in 
you know, if, if you're one of these people where you just train in the gi or you just train no gi or you don't train leg locks, um, to, to live behind that I don't want to say facade, but to live behind that. Uh, it's like a self-delusion, right? It's, it's yeah, like, uh, you know, to, to say that, well, I don't need to know heel hooks because I never compete under a heel hook uh, rule set. Like, that, that is a fair point. I mean, you can be a successful competitor and not know anything about heel hooks. But, but I'll say this at the same time, you know, learning about heel hooks and leg locks, I, my understanding of lever control and pummeling mm-hmm. concepts improved greatly. And also, yeah, just, just the lever control when we're talking about coming up for sweeps and controlling legs and, and all that. So, so there's huge things to gain, even, even if learning something like a heel hook isn't your thing, you know, to, to not train in or uh, with or without the gi, you know, you're kind of denying yourself a lot of opportunities to learn. Um, and another example I like to point out is, you know, if you, if you do uh, no gi, but you don't train gi a lot, <clears throat> You know, if someone gets on your back and you're wearing a gi, you're going to get choked out six ways to Sunday usually because you're not used to all the collar uh, variations that are possible, all the different, you know, collar chokes. But if you're, if you're used to the gi, you know how simple it can be if someone grabs your collar that you can get choked out quick. So I do find that gi and no gi do complement each other in ways that you, you don't really expect. And when someone tells me that they just do one or the other, uh, I usually can see it right away when I roll with them that yes, there are certain concepts lacking. So, you know, my, my whole thing is always train both gi and no gi. Yeah. That's a a good example of where people kind of gravitate towards their comfort zone, right? You know, they, they, for whatever reason, whether it be because they just don't train it with, with a particular rule set or whether it just be because they've kind of convinced themselves that they don't need an area of the game. They shy away from that and they just never look at it and it just never comes up for them until it, it does. And then they have a problem. You know, it, this is the thing about a lot of, um, you know, very specific positions or, or very specific moves. You don't necessarily need to use these moves, right? I mean, hey, you can, you know, if, if you don't think that you, if barren bolos are just not the move for you, you don't have to use them but you should still learn them because yeah. at least you need to know how to defend them <laughs> right Absolutely, yeah. right you know even if you never intend to use them because that's not part of your strategy you have to realize that for other people it might be part of their strategy and that's where these targeted positions can be important right the thing is every school does have a distinct style right having trained at a few different schools i i know that you know they're even if you have an open mind everyone kind of has their own culture and that means there are going to be different types of moves that you gravitate to depending on who your teachers are and you know you can't always assume that just because you're comfortable with everything that gets thrown at you in the gym if you go somewhere else you will also be comfortable because Mm -hmm. they might do completely different things that you don't expect Um, and that's one of the things that um, can become a big issue when when you're talking about overcoming plateaus, right? You want to not just know, deal with the blind spots that you know about, but you also want to actively seek out and identify the blind spots that you might not know about, right? It's one thing if you realize your back defense is bad and you have to work on your back defense. Well, then the strategies we've talked about can help you. But the other thing is like, what if you don't know that you're weak mm-hmm. at this particular position? That's when seeking feedback starts to become important. Um, You need to train with a variety of people and you need to make it clear to that person that you are open to and you want their feedback, right? Especially if it's a higher higher ranking or an experienced person, you don't want them to just squish you. You want them to squish you and then kind of give you a report card and tell you what to work on. That's always helpful. Mm -hmm. And the moral of the story is, guys, if you're having... Uh, if you're doing well in your normal training and then you go somewhere and you're getting constantly caught with the same entanglement in the gym or you're, you know, the same thing keeps happening and you're finding that there's a pattern happening, go towards that pattern. That is mm-hmm. a clear gaping hole in your game that needs to be patched up and worked on. So take that, you know, when you, when you meet adversity, generally go right towards it and try and that's what you, that's what you should be heading towards, not continually feeding your comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, A related concept to what we're talking about here when we talk about training with purpose is something called Kaizen. So this is a Japanese term that means continuous improvement. It's something that you see a lot in the work world. It's a process for making sure that you're always getting better. Uh, this is, I work in software and this is something that we use as, uh, significantly in the workplace. Basically the idea behind Kaizen is 
It doesn't matter if things went well or if you failed or if things were kind of neutral. You always want to figure out how can I take the next step up? The mistake a lot of people make is they think, hey, things are going pretty well. And then they just kind of keep doing the same thing. You have to never be satisfied with your results, um, regardless of whether you know you did great or you didn't do great. There's always an opportunity to improve. And it, you shouldn't get upset about doing, uh, you know, if you do too poorly or uh, if you do too great. The, regardless, the process should be the same. Every time something happens, you basically analyze what you did. You figure out how you can do better next time. And then you try that. And then after you try that, you do the same thing. You analyze and then you evaluate how you could do better. And then the next time you try that, it's, it's almost like a little mini scientific method where you're, you know, every time you do something, you measure the results and then you come up with a hypothesis and then you try again. And and the thing is, too, you don't want to be too emotionally attached to either your wins or your losses. That's a big part of Kaizen. Uh, the, every single attempt is just an iteration. And then your goal is to learn and get better the next time, regardless of what your result was. So this kind of ties into training with purpose because you want to not just show up to class, but, you know, you want to have a goal. Afterwards, you want to kind of measure and evaluate how you did. You might even want to seek other people's feedback. You want to define a strategy for how you can be even better next time. And then you want to go and try that and see if it works, right? It's a constant, by doing this, you're not just blindly going and training, but you're setting goals and you're, you're figuring out where the next step is for you rather than just kind of hoping you hit the next step. You're trying, you're kind of trying to identify what it is. And then afterwards, you're trying to see if you actually hit that or not. Yeah. Th there's a lot of world champions that, um, they obsess about their mistakes. And I, I don't just mean, uh, their losses in competition, because obviously I'm sure they obsess mm -hmm. about the losses in competition, but even, even in training, like a, a guy that I like to study is Travis Stevens. He's a <clears throat> Olympic silver medalist. He's a black belt under John Danner, obviously a judo black belt. Um, one of the one of the strongest work ethics in any grappler today um and and this guy always talks about you know when you when you go to the gym later on at night it should uh it, you should obsess a little bit about mm -hmm. about things that you did right and things that you did wrong obviously spending more time on things you did wrong in training and um and and i sort of i took that away i don't i don't obsess of, about mistakes that i make to the point where i hate myself for them <laughs> and uh, get emotional because i know a lot of people do get emotional when they lose mm -hmm. uh like a great example is like ronda rousey and even if you read her book um she she talks a lot about how she she, she cries a lot <laughs> basically <laughs> a lot of a lot of crying in Ronda Rousey but um <clears throat> but sometimes that's what's demanded to be the best in the world and I sort of took that and thought well I can still be that obsessed about being uh about my own self-improvement but i don't need to get so emotionally invested in it where i'm going to hate myself if i lose that is when i think uh things can become unhealthy and you can actually start to uh resent the art right so i yeah. always i always wanted to do jujitsu uh because i enjoyed it not because i wanted to be a world champion or uh for whatever reason i i wanted to do it because i i wanted to enjoy doing it and i want to keep enjoying it and if it becomes something where it eats at me and my own mistakes haunt me and i can't sleep at night because of it um that's where it starts to work in reverse so you know if it if you're not thinking about your training session afterward, I don't think that's a good thing. I think you should definitely at least think about something you did well, something you could do better on, and a, and a way that you can improve, like a strategy to improve. But definitely, um, especially for all the young competitors out there, if, if you lose, uh, you know, chalk it up as a loss. Find out where things went wrong. Make make adjustments to your game and your strategy and then get them next time. There's always going to be more competitions. There's always going to be another training session. Um, just, you know, it, like you said, getting emotionally vested in, in wins and losses is not a healthy thing. This ties back to the mindfulness episode we did a while ago where you don't want your emotions to be the driver of your car. You know, you want to be observing your emotions and you want to, you know, kind of come to terms with them, but you don't want to let your emotions completely manage your behavior. And, you know, Ronda Rousey is a great example. Another good example from back in the day was Mike Tyson, right? These were guys who had 
killer mindsets until they didn't, right? They were on top of the world as long as they were winning. And then they weren't. And then they were never the same afterwards. Yeah. Um, and that kind of goes to show the importance of, of mindset. And But then again, you also see other people who, you know, they, yeah, they're on top of the world and then they lose and they adjust and then they keep going and That's then right. they keep winning. And I think a key to that, and you know, granted, not a competitor here, but this is something that you do see in other walks of life. Uh, I think a key to that is discipline distancing yourself a bit from your emotions and evaluating your performance like a scientist would evaluate something, right? Being objective and just being like, hey, what went well? What didn't go well? How can I do better next time? And, you know, you just make a little experiment out of it. Make a, you know, if you do that, if you follow the scientific method, then it separates you from that emotion and it just becomes like a loop. You know, every time you train, you ask these questions of yourself and it doesn't matter if you won or lost. It's always going to be about how do I get to the next step? Um, that's the kind of mindset that I think not only allows you to be healthier in the long term, but also more consistent and take you into the later years as well. Yeah, when I think when you train as much as I do, uh, you, <laughs> after training, you're just glad that you did not get injured. That's <laughs> that's, that's honestly it. Like I I just went through a rough knee injury in uh, a few months ago, and now when I train, I just I I'm so thankful when I get out of there healthy. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's it's combat, right? Like anything can go wrong. Um, any injury that you get, that's when I that that's when I actually get a bit depressed, and mm-hmm. I got to check myself and say, hey, you know what? Like this is just a blip in the radar. I'm gonna get back from this. This is a learning experience. Try to look at the positive side of this injury. Let's move forward. Let's you know do the physio, do whatever has to be done to get back. And then when I get back and I feel good, then it's just a blessing every time you finish practice and you feel healthy. It's a, every time you compete, even win or lose, if you're healthy, it's a blessing. So that's definitely something not to take for granted. Yeah. And, you know, downtime. At some point, I think, Matt, you wanted to do an episode specifically about downtime. And I think that would be a great topic. But even when you're off the mat for whatever reason and you're not able to train, you can still train with purpose, right? I mean, you absolutely you probably won't gain the same benefits as if you're actually on the mat, but you can set goals to go through different material that you've been meaning to do to review footage. Um, to, you know, to kind of like, you know, mentally drill things. There's a lot of things that you can do even if you can't train. So Mm -hmm. this comes down to setting goals, right? You might have to tailor the goals if, you know, you hit an obstacle, but at the end of the day, you can always train somehow and training with purpose allows you to maximize what you get out of that. Absolutely. Yeah. There's so much more, pardon me. There's so much more to growth than just being able to train on the mats. A lot of a lot of jujitsu is mental, as we've discussed. So, you know, training off the mats is just as beneficial at times. When it comes to how you get to the next step, you know, we talked about Kaizen and how you want to identify what the next step is and always be looking for that next step. Something that I've found, and Matt, maybe correct, tell me if you feel differently on this, but I've kind of come to the the uh, the opinion lately that you can't, when you're learning something new, you can't absorb it all in a one, at once. You're going to have to revisit the same thing multiple times. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, I, th- I think probably the best example is, you know, when you're just starting out and you're learning how to do an arm bar, you know, it it can kind of be explained to you. It's going to take you long enough to just figure out kind of what to do with your hands and legs. But even years later, you're when, you know, you know the 12 steps to doing an arm bar, you're still kind of learning little ways to increase the pressure. And you're still learning variations and what to do depending on how your opponent moves. Um, I, I find that a lot of the time, and this is especially important when I'm teaching, you have to understand that people can't absorb the full technique in one go. Right. You have to kind of give them the like Cole's Notes version the first time. And you have to understand that they're not going to remember everything. And then the next class, you give them the same technique and then you add one little thing. And then you add one little thing. And I find that sometimes it takes, you know, it can take many, many times re- going through the same technique before it really sticks and you really master it. And I think sometimes people are hard on themselves because they they want to be good at something and they're frustrated because they can't do it right now. Um, and maybe even they've, they've been taught that move frequently and they still can't do it. But I think the thing that I find is you need to go into these situations where, hey, I've reviewed this move before, but maybe today I'll get one more thing out of this that I, I didn't know before. And I find this actually even today with very simple stuff. You know, I can go to a, a, a fundamentals class about closed guard 
And someone might bring up something that I just didn't think about before. It's just a little detail. So rather than trying to learn everything all in one go, I'm incrementally building on stuff over the years. And I find that when, you know, when it comes to playing the long game in jujitsu, it's important to understand that you can't just fully absorb a technique on the first go. Yeah, this is a concept that applies to really learning anything. And uh, mm-hmm. especially in jujitsu, when there's such a variety of techniques and positions and guards and whatever, um, pretty, it, it pretty much applies to anything that I've ever learned in jujitsu. You know, you, you, some, it, you're, it depends on the type of learner that you are, but uh, myself, I'm a bit of a sponge. And when I learn stuff, you know, it, you're going to someone, let's say someone explains to you what worm guard is. You know, and for the first day, all you're trying to do is get that lapel through the legs and get your grips and figure out that pattern. How do I get into my position, get to that worm position so that I can start doing all my all my different techniques? Um, It's like layering, right? Like learning techniques can be like layering in the experience. And it's it's the same thing for whether it's worm guard, leg entanglements, you know, deli heat, whatever, whatever position that you are in the process of becoming familiar with. It's not going to happen overnight. It's it's jujitsu is all about uh, mental and muscle memory and really embedding the 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 techniques into your mind and your body until that it's it's natural and it can happen organically in live time. So you know every if you have an open mind and like let's say I learn uh, a, t- a certain type of guard and I start drilling it and then I start putting it in practice and you know it gets shut down a little bit and then it starts I get, I get a little bit of success with it um, a lot of the time if I learned on a video about th- whatever I, this guard is I'll go back a few weeks later or a month later and watch the same video and see if I can pick up any extra tech uh, details that I may have missed or forgotten about. Um, and then you can add that on top of your, your existing knowledge that you've, you've been, you've been working on for the last little bit. So again, just think about like uh, when you're learning these things, try to layer in the, um, the experience because it's not going to happen overnight. It's something that takes time and it takes time for your mind and your body to program it in so that you can do it naturally and effectively in a live situation. It's very important that people understand when they beat themselves up over hitting a plateau, things like incremental learning matter because nobody learns everything all at once, right? Sometimes what feels like a plateau is really just kind of you building on those layers and you might not be noticing it in any observable way. But the important thing is to just keep at it and keep picking up these little details and they do add up eventually. This kind of ties into the last of the mental models I want to talk about here, which is that if you are, if you want to play for the long game or, and this applies to anything in life, if you want to achieve long-term results, you want to prioritize effort over the results. The best, and what I mean by that is you want to focus less on, hey, here's the result I want. Why don't I have that? And you want to focus more on the steps you're taking and the routines you're building to get you to that point and just making sure you're sticking to those every day. The classic example of this is weight loss, right? If your goal is I want to lose 10 pounds and you go on like a diet or something and every day you check the scale and you get depressed because your weight loss isn't going the way you want or maybe your weight goes up, right? And you get even more depressed. If the only thing you're focusing on is that number on the scale, the the result, then you're kind of not seeing the big picture and you're probably also creating a mindset where over the long term you're going to lose motivation. Whereas the better approach is to focus on small daily routines and habits that you can build that will eventually get you to that result and not worry so much about the long-term result, but focus on the process. So rather than say, saying, hey, I want to set, I want to lose 10 pounds, set a goal of like, hey, I want to stick to 2000 calories a day and I want to have eight cups of water and I want to work out once a day or something like that, right? And th- that's more digestible. Every, you, you know, you don't even worry so much about the long term. Just mm-hmm. every day, you do, you, you check those boxes, you do that process, and over time, you'll get where you want to go. This is a similar approach to what people do in investing as well, where, you know, people who kind of, they, they always tell you, like, don't check your stocks on a daily basis and worry about buying and selling. Just set up a process, you know, f- f- set up a financial goal for yourself and a process for how you want to invest, and then just do that and then just keep doing that and putting your money into that and don't focus on the long term just because it's going to take it's going to distract you from from what you need to do focus on the daily weekly monthly process and stick to that process i find in jujitsu that's also super important you know people beat themselves up like crazy about hitting plateaus 
the best way to get to to really to break a plateau is to not even worry about plateaus, but just set up whatever your your training objectives are. Like, hey, I want to train three, four times a week and just do that and then just keep doing that. Um, the thing about learning is that it's sometimes non-linear, right? It's not like you learn the exact same amount every single class. Sometimes, and I, I found this in jujitsu for myself, sometimes you can go months without really feeling like you're learning everything. And then in like a period of a week, everything can change for you. Where suddenly like you just, you grow by quantum leaps. And the best way to make sure that you capitalize on those windows is just keep training, right? Yep. Um, same thing with investing as well. Um, a lot of the big gains on the stock market come in very short periods of time. And if you worry too much about moving in and out of the stock market, you could miss those windows. Sometimes, you know, growth is nonlinear. And the best way to make sure that you experience the most most growth is to prioritize effort over the results. Yeah, I, th I think the diet example was awesome. And rather than focusing on the end result and getting frustrated uh, that it's not happening now, focus on sustainable lifestyle goals like you said things that are consistent things that are every day and um and in time the results happen naturally and it's the same thing for let's say a competitor if my goal is to you know i want to win this tournament or i want to win i want to medal every tournament or or whatever i want to win all my matches it's something that I don't just I don't just say that I'm going to win that. What am what are the steps that I'm going to do? What kind of effort am I going to I'm going to make sure I'm on weight. I'm going to make sure I train every day, ideally multiple times a day if my lifestyle accommodates that. Um, I'm going to make sure that I'm thinking about points during the rounds. I'm going to make sure that I don't duck any difficult roles. I'm going to make sure that I ask questions. I'm going to make sure that I'm, you know, always bouncing ideas off each other and, and uh, getting feedback from my training partners and my coaches. Um, these are the little goals that add up to results in the end and putting the results and the medals ahead of the steps that will actually make you a champion or make you successful, uh, whether you're a competitor or just even a hobbyist trying to get better or a gym owner uh, businessman <clears throat> just think about the, the little steps that you can do every day that add up to a lot rather than you know basically putting the chicken before the egg and the thing to bear in mind too is that the results can mislead you sometimes right maybe if you have not set the right result or you don't quite understand the result then focusing on the result can cause you issues. I mean, going back to the weight loss example, if your concern is simply to see that number on the scale go down, you might be setting yourself up for disappointment because it's very common for people who are new to exercise to put on weight initially because they're building up muscle mass, right? So, yeah. you know, and, and if all you're looking at is the number on the scale, then you could be getting discouraged by legitimate progress. And so that's why focusing on the, on having a good process and the effort you put in is more important than obsessing over the results yeah and you might you might f try and find ways to do it in an unhealthy way like starving yourself mm -hmm. to try and get that number lower quicker uh, usually the modest consistent effort is the right answer mm -hmm. yeah i know ev i know everyone wants the quick fix but honestly sometimes you know well, actually in all the time really what you want to do is you want to focus on building the routines and the habits that will get you there and in and thinking micro not not macro right like you you rather than thinking about you know being a, a champion it's better to think about the daily habits that you can build and focusing on that because that is something that is a lot easier to time box to measure to to iterate off of and it also gives you you know it puts you in a situation where you're also building um you know a quality routine and if you have a quality routine, then you can kind of pivot the results that you want later. Whereas if you focus and, and your only goal is to get one particular result, you know, sometimes the world changes and that result doesn't make sense for you anymore. And then what are you left with? So mm -hmm. it's, it's very important to prioritize the process and the effort over those results. Mm -hmm. So question time, uh, an interesting one came in this again, and this is something that I think is a massive topic, but it's something that is dear to my heart. So let's dig into it a bit now. We've been asked to discuss some strategies for a movement-oriented grappler to deal with a control-based grappler. Now, I interpret this to mean the old size discussion. How do you beat someone who is bigger and or stronger than you? Matt, you want to kick this off? Yeah, so if, um, if I'm a movement-based grappler or a smaller grappler fighting someone who is a control-based grappler or larger... Um, I like the analogy of a rock in the river. 
And I basically don't want to meet uh, someone who's stronger than me with strength. I don't want to be a rock versus a rock. I want to be water going around the rock. So generally, I try to, well, definitely win the engagement phase of guard. So grips dictate what's going to happen, basically. If I let someone who's bigger and stronger uh, get their grips and get on top of me and use gravity and use their weight and strength, then I'm going to be digging myself out of a hole pretty quickly. But if I can, if I can be a little bit more frugal and I can maintain range and, uh, and basically just manage that range to a point where they can never get on top and and essentially just be cheap <laughs> and uh and reset if i need to 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 manage the distance in such a way where i'm losing the exchange then that's what i'll do i'll i'm not afraid to to keep resetting and try and just enter the second or third uh se- sorry second phase of guard on my terms so that I'm the one who's dominating the grip battle. And this could mean, you know, getting good lever control and uh, eventually getting a dominant angle. I, I like the example of an arm drag. That's probably one of my favorite examples, especially with someone who's much bigger and stronger. Um, and using using mechanisms like two-on-ones is really important for someone who's, you know, if their arm is gigantic, I can't just control it with one arm. I'm usually going to need a two-on-one and, uh, and probably break their alignment with some internal shoulder rotation, such as an arm drag. So definitely don't let them get on top of you. Don't fight their strength with your strength. Make sure that you set up uh, strong frames if they do and try and work your way back into a position where you're safe again and you can reset the guard exchange. Like you said, when you're dealing with a significant strength and or size disadvantage, I think that the engagement phase is where you're going to have the most luck. That's the most important thing. If someone is really big and strong, if they can't grab you, they can't beat you. That You need to get grips on the other person. When you're smaller, you need to make sure that you win that grip fight. We talked earlier about two mental models for the engagement phase. One is grips dictate positions. What we mean here is that if you can win the grip fight and establish dominant grips, you're much more likely to be able to advance position than if the opposite is true. Against bigger guys, this is especially important because bigger guys can get grips and control them in ways that are different from little guys. If Mm -hmm. if their hands are that big and that strong, they might be able to control you with their hands in ways that other people need sleeves for. If I think that everyone's probably been in the situation. Some people are just so strong and they have really big hands and just trying to do a standard grip break might be really, really difficult to do. So I guess a larger opponent is especially important that you win that grip fight. And we talked about how if you don't win, you need to invert grip control and make sure that you do turn it into a dominant grip for yourself. That can be very hard against a big guy, but it's incredibly important to win that engagement phase. Another thing to think about is that you want to avoid giving them levers to control. We talked up previously about limb coiling, meaning that you want to keep your elbows and your knees tucked. You want to prevent your your opponent from getting his hand under your chin and using your neck as a lever. That's really important against big guys too. It, you want to make sure that you don't give them something that they can grab onto because they can exert a lot of force over you if they succeed in doing that. Those are probably the big things from my perspective. Additionally, another thing to think about is that when you're dealing with a big strong guy, you know, clinging onto him, body tethering where you're connected to them and they can lift you up and move you around, you might be able to get away with this against someone your own size. You know, kind of the classic examples like jumping guard or throwing up a triangle from guard. But against a bigger guy, if they're strong enough, you're basically turning yourself into a tetherball tied to their body. And that's not somewhere that you want to be. Yeah, the the only example that I can really think of is if I'm actually behind my opponent and I have such a dominant angle that I feel like they can't attack me, then I might tether myself to their body. Mm -hmm. Or ideally, I like a crucifix because I have a two on one on one of their arms and usually both my legs are dominating the other arm, right? So I I also have opposite side control, rotational control, uh, and I have that dominant angle, so I feel quite safe. Yeah. Another thing we didn't talk about was uh, not just being on the bottom of a large opponent, but being on top of a larger Mm -hmm. opponent. If you do happen to get on top, um, like you said, tethering your body to them a lot of the time will get you swept. And sometimes if you're, let's say, in side control or neon belly, uh, they're able to do the old CrossFit escape, elevate you, and just by way of being so strong, they can 
use gravity uh, or, or deflect gravity and and make the n- enough space where they can regard. So um, in these cases, I would definitely either try to isolate a lever, a two on one in, in like a Kimura would be a really strong way to to control your opponent and also get to their back. And another thing would be to transition, because if you are smaller, you should you know, be more mobile than someone who's a lot larger and stronger. So a lot of the time having a mobile top game is going to keep you ahead of your opponent's defenses. And uh, especially also addressing, you know, if they're, if they're framing right into you and you, you know, which way they're framing, uh, if you can change the force vector. So let's say I'm in neon belly and person on the bottom is big and strong. He frames with his arms. You know, I only have a second before he starts, you know, he's created enough space. He can get his legs back inside. But if I transition to a reverse neon belly, uh, I like to use the example of a knee on top of their shoulder, changing the force vector from driving towards their head to now driving towards their feet. Um, it's an effective way to deal with it because their frames essentially become useless and you start transitioning towards almost a north south position. So having that north south transition, the top spinning transition, and then looking to isolate the end of a lever is probably my big, my best bet against a bigger opponent. Thanks for clarifying that. I probably should have gotten into this. When I, when I talk about body tethering, that's okay if you've broken your opponent's alignment and you've, you've broken their posture structure in base, but if if you haven't done that, you definitely don't want to do that against a stronger opponent. Now, you might be able to get away with this against someone your own size or smaller, but against a bigger guy, if you kind of cling on to them and they still have their alignment, they can really move you. And, you know, an example, Matt, that you gave is if you're on top position, right? If you're on top side control, I, I think everyone can relate to this. You're sparring with a guy much bigger than you. You get side control. You try to put your weight down on them and they just bench press you and throw you off. Well, that's because you tethered your body to theirs, but and they were still able to generate force. Now, against a person your own size, they might not be able to generate enough force to overcome gravity, but a bigger person might be able to. So I like your example of how to deal with that, where you're you're just changing the angle and you're moving. You're getting up to neon belly or reverse knee ride, because that changes the angle in such a way that you're not really tethered to them anymore. Now you're kneeling on them, and that really reduces the amount of surface area that he can manipulate, because it's just your knee touching him now, rather than your whole body. Mm-hmm. Cool. So just to recap this, I hope this was a useful episode. I know that overcoming plateaus is a a problem that a lot of people bring to my attention, especially at a senior level. To go over the mental models that we talked about today, we talked about self-competition, meaning focus on competing against yourself. Be better than the person you were yesterday rather than worrying about what the guy in the other lane is doing. We talked about plus minus equals, meaning you want to train with a variety of different people. You want to train with people who are better than you, worse than you, and people who are roughly on par to you. Uh, we talked about in investing in loss, meaning that you want to focus on um, going into your areas of weakness. You want to understand that being bad is an investment towards being good later and you can't be good at something unless you were bad at it initially. We talked about training with purpose, meaning that you want to always have training goals for everything you do, not not even just training or competing, but even for little things like watching YouTube videos or instructionals. We talked about Kaizen, meaning the process of always trying to be better, not getting emotionally attached to wins and losses, but focusing on creating a feedback loop for making sure that you're always improving every way through the cycle. We talked about incremental learning, meaning um, making sure that you're understanding that you can't get everything at once. You have to be repeatedly exposed to a technique and each time you bolt on more details that you weren't ready for before. We talked about the scientific method, um, and this kind of ties very closely into Kaizen, basically objectively measuring your performance, analyzing it, and trying to come up with proposals and solutions, and then measuring those proposals and solutions to see if you can fix the problems that you identified. And trying to break your own success. Yeah, trying to break your own success is the big thing. It's actually a form of humility in a lot of ways. And we talked about prioritizing effort over results. So rather than getting overly caught up in the goals that you want to achieve, focusing on the things that you you can control right now, building solid habits and routines that over time will lead to the results that you want to see. Matt, anything else that you want to add? No, just want to thank you guys for all your support and keep the questions coming and uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah, take care guys. Thanks again. The questions are super helpful. The feedback is super helpful. Talk to you next time.